Nature Matters, the WWF India podcast for a living planet. This is the podcast you want to hear for all your updates on wildlife, nature, people and the planet. We all love the Asian elephant. The Asian elephant is India's national heritage animal. It's also the rarest elephant on earth. We have with us Dr. Nitin Shekhar. He's been WWF India's elephant lead for the last five years. He's leaving WWF India today and we thought it would be the perfect time to catch up with him. So I have a few questions for you, Nitin. Let's start with your favorite memory of an Indian elephant in the wild. So one of my favorite memories was when I was visiting a watchtower in Butser Tiger Reserve and they had placed some salt out for some animals and a young female elephant came out to have some of the salt. And for some reason, a nearby peacock decided that he was going to start dancing near that elephant. And even though the elephant's obviously way bigger than a peacock's, for some reason, it really spooked her. Mm -hmm. And she actually ran towards the forest and she sat there on the edge, like kind of holding her trunk in her mouth, trying to figure out what to do about the strange incident. And then she decided to try and charge the peacock. And so she ran towards the peacock and the peacock just thought that, oh, you know, she's trying to get past me. So he just took a few steps to the side after putting his feathers down. And then he put his feathers up again. And the elephant was so confused about how this small animal was brave enough to withstand her that she again ran to the forest and held her trunk. And just kind of showed the individuality of elephants because there's so many elephants you know, we've seen, that I've seen, you've seen, that are much bolder than that and that seem to be fearless. And, and it kind of shows that just like in order for us to understand people, we have to see them as individuals. To really understand elephants, we have to see them as individuals too. That's a wonderful way to put it, especially because we all often say that elephants are like people because they're so closely bonded and they, they have these deep uh, memories of the landscape, just like we do a favorite place, um, a favorite memory, perhaps. So you've been with WWF India for the last five years, leading the elephant uh, work. So tell us a bit about the work that is done by WWF for elephants and what are some of the biggest challenges and maybe some of the best opportunities that we've had, the best successes we've had for elephants? Sure. So, so WF India's work on elephants is spanning mostly across three areas. One is human-wildlife conflict, a human-elephant conflict, which obviously has to do with the relationship of elephants and communities. Um, another is about habitat protection and restoration, so making sure that they're are enough natural resources to support elephants as far as um, you know, like forests and grasslands, food, water, that sort of thing. Um, and the third is connectivity. So making sure that elephants, which need large areas to move, are actually able to get from one habitat area to the other in India's crowded landscapes. Yeah. And so we've done some really, I think, cool things as a team in the last four or five years. Um, on the connectivity front, after 15 years of efforts by my colleagues down in, um, in Tamil Nadu, mm -hmm. uh, we were able to get the government to make some real commitments to protecting the color corridor. So basically, elephants go from around Satyamangalam in northern Tamil Nadu towards Atapati, which is in eastern Kerala, and they pass right by Coimbatore in that process. And so there's like a thin strip of land between the mountains of Western Ghats and human habitation that, if protected, would allow elephants to continue to do this natural movement. Mm -hmm. And so there were a bunch of things that were threatening that corridor, like um, increasing traffic on a highway. People have started building fences for tourism purposes to protect gardens. Uh, there's a couple of educational institutions that were built there. And WF India has like very step-by-step -step addressed these threats, yeah. um, including getting the government to commit to building a flyover um, over a key part of the corridor so that the 12,000 vehicles that cross by every day won't bother the elephants. The elephants can actually go underneath it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's been a big victory. Um, in habitat restoration, we've done a couple of cool things. We have had research really, because our work in habitats is relatively new. Um, in general, there hasn't been enough of that in India. And so one thing we did in the Northeast, in Assam, is we conducted the first successful GPS collarings of wild elephants. We've done two so far and we're hoping to do a few more. And before people thought that elephants were moving between Arunachal Pradesh and Assam in this area and that they didn't really 
kind of go across tea estates and move into adjacent forests. Yeah. And we've shown just in a year and a half of coloring that elephants are using the landscape in a completely different way. Um, and sometimes one of my uh, colleagues, young colleagues who would go out there and track the elephants, he would go to the place where there was the most recent GPS location mm -hmm. uh, from an elephant. And he'd go in, you know, just like the night before. And he'd be asking people, hey, you know, have you seen any elephants here? And people are like, no, no, there's no, there are no elephants here. And, you know, that was untrue. Like, literally, these elephants are sneaking around, you know, like mice or leopards and coming really close to communities and hiding in forests nearby. And people don't know that this three-ton, four-ton, five-ton animal yeah. is just nearby. So that's been a really sort of great set of insights, I think, that shows power of research in understanding how we can conserve animals. Um, and we have, we have another project going on to restore lantana. Mm -hmm. and, oh, well, it's not restore lantana. Uh, remove lantana, you mean? Sorry, remove lantana. Yeah. Remove lantana and restore elephant habitat. Yeah. Um, so lantana is an invasive species that's taken over 60% of some of the reserves in southern India. Mm -hmm. It's not palatable, it's not edible to elephants and most other herbivores. And so by coming up with ways to remove lantana and restore native vegetation, we can really bring back habitat that otherwise is inaccessible, inaccessible to elephants and a host of other species. And we've also do, done some great awareness work. We have a, a children's book about elephants called Elephants of Super Creatures. It's been published in English in partnership with Crossword Books. And we also have a Hindi version, a Tamil version, a Malayalam version. And we want to both help urban children and rural ch children who live alongside elephants know just how cool these animals are, that they can recognize themselves in mirrors, that they have, you know, five times more, uh, they can sense five times more different types of smells than we can with their nose, you know, how far they can swim, like all these cool facts that yeah. we picked up yeah. to help people appreciate the animal we live alongside. So Nitin, there is a, now a significant population of elephants in central India. And, you know, in many ways, we feel that they're recolonizing their old lands and we now have many elephants in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, this is going to be a management challenge. It's going to be a challenge uh, uh, even for protected area managers. We know that an elephant from Kanha was picked up and taken to an elephant camp. But increasingly, as elephants make their way back into certain landscapes, uh, this is a challenge that we have to face. So what do you think is the way forward? So I guess the core of this problem is basically one of human-elephant conflict. Yes, yes, yes. And, and so I, I, I think that there's probably several steps that we need, we need to take. I mean, one which you know, isn't actually the most urgent, but one that we clearly need to take is just understand what's going on. We don't have mm -hmm. any really good res research on how elephants are using the landscape, why they may, may be coming, yeah. um, any sort of projections of where they might go. And so that's maybe not the most urgent, but it's an important step. Um, in the short term, I see the most immediate thing we need to do is help people in this area learn how to live alongside elephants mm. because you know they haven't been there for some 400 500 years so the, the people's cultural memory of how to stay safe around elephants has essentially evaporated yeah. and so we need best practices from other parts of the country where folks have you know pretty successfully lived alongside elephants for quite some time to be sort of conveyed to folks living in Madhya Pradesh and other neighboring areas um, and in addition, we need to start building institutions that allow, well, that safeguard elephants and safeguard people from elephants when necessary uh, in, in Madhya Pradesh. And in fact, they've already taken some steps towards that. They have a new standard operating procedure that's actually ad adopted from our own materials here at WWF India to help kind of uh, communities understand what institutions they need to keep an eye out for elephants and to safely keep elephants and people apart, what government institutions need to be there to support communities how to collect the right data about elephants so you can figure out, you know, some individuals are different than others. Some may be a little more aggressive, some might be a little more friendly yeah. and to help identify those and treat them differently. So I think those are sort of the main steps that need to be taken. In fact, and that, those, those things have to be done across the country, but it's particularly urgent in Madhya Pradesh because communities are seeing elephants for the first time in centuries. Yeah. And you're talking about materials and of course we have uh this field manual for managing human and elephant conflict and I think it's a great book because it has such practical advice. Oftentimes uh, it's hard to come up with uh, practical advice in such difficult situations. So do tell us a bit 
about the human elephant conflict manual yeah so so basically for tigers there's like a standard operating procedure yeah. recommended by the national tiger conservation authority on what to do in case of human tiger conflict um there isn't one for elephants in part because elephants are much more complicated in many ways than tigers like the <laughs> diversity of things that they do the di- diversity of responses required don't lend themselves to like a 6 10 13 page document and so there was sort of a, a a real effort across institutions to come up with some sort of guidance yeah. on on how to how to react how to respond to the human elephant conflict and even how to proactively prevent it and so wf india uh, we worked with the ministry of environment forest and climate change and project elephant um we we spoke a lot with our on the ground experts some of whom have been working on this problem for decades like collectively if over 100 years of experience working on this issue and we put together a field manual of best practices right. on how to respond to emergencies how to work with communities how to build barriers how to deal with particularly aggressive individual elephants and how to collect data And so we put this in a format that is relatively easy to use and easy to read, lots of illustrations and and diagrams and and tables. And we we you know have kind of started this process of building institutions that treat elephants like individuals. Right. Um and and make sure that we have the right response in the right circumstances. So, you know that I've read your book, uh, What's Left of the Jungle, which is a non-fiction based on real people that you met in Baksa Tiger Reserve in West Bengal. So you know in that book you have the central value for um being humane to elephants but also the welfare of people so i think you're placing both at equal pedestals and uh tell us more about that it's i mean sometimes we feel that we're not focusing enough on the people aspect sometimes we feel we're not focusing enough on the animal aspect so it's so interesting that you focus on both tell us more about the book and about this uh positioning that you do Thanks Neha. Um yeah, so in some sense that's exactly what motivated the the writing of the book is that when people see human elephant in conflict I think they tend to fall into one camp or the other kind yes. of squarely. Yeah. So either there's like oh my gosh these poor people they're so poor and you know these elephants are destroying their livelihood or it's like oh the elephants you know their natural habitat is being destroyed and they have nowhere to go so this is why this happening or they they're, they're just innocent animals they are national heritage animal yeah. um and so i think the best way to sort of break down that sort of empathy barrier make sure that we have empathy for both the marginalized yeah. people and yeah. the the animals involved is through narrative and through story mm. so it help, help us relate to folks and so i had the great fortune of having an amazing field assistant when i was doing my phd in Baksa Tiger Reserve whose name in the book is Akshu Atri and and he has just this amazing life he was born in this forest he grew up there he had you know kind of engages with tigers and leopards and elephants and civets and you know you name it and by telling his story and both showing how much he struggled mm-hmm. with poverty and with conflict with animals but also how much he really still loved the the wild animals and the habitat around him. Yeah. I think kind of lays that empathy platform on which you can kind of build a a more sort of well-rounded policy structure yes, for helping yes. people and wildlife. Yes, yes, yes. So, I mean, if I were to look 5 years ahead, what is the future for elephants 5 years from now? Where do you see them? And what is it that we need to do now? Yeah, so I I guess um it's harder for me to know, you know, to to know where we will be in 5 years than to kind of speculate hopefully where we should be <laughs> yeah. uh in in 5 years um so and and i think that the elephant conservation community in india is you know is creative dynamic and really just passionate and eager to try and yeah. address these problems so um i'm cautiously optimistic uh so so one thing that i think we need to do differently is just get more of the fundamental data Mm. Uh, that we need to understand mm. the situation. So I think that there's a game change for tiger conservation when we figured out how to use camera traps to estimate the number of tigers out there and know where they are. Yeah. And we just haven't had that game change movement for elephants yet. And so the technology seems to be out there now. We have technology that allows us to 
get DNA samples from elephant dung that's、mm-hmm. kind of degraded, but still potentially identify individuals. Right. And we right. have the statistical mo- models, or we can develop the statistical models with the math we know、mm-hmm. to use those DNA samples to estimate how many elephants there are in an area、um, and to track individuals using that DNA. So I think that can really kind of help us know what we're dealing with. Where are there, you know, a lot of elephants? Where are where is it where is it in a, a mirage where we think there's a lot, but there just、yeah. isn't enough habitat to support them? Yeah.、Um, and that'll help us really direct our our interventions. And and I think the next step then is once you know kind of the population level information, is to really start treating elephants as individuals. We can there's only thirty thousand of them. You know, we are a country of big data. Yeah. And we can absolutely. You know, as we collect in- samples, as certain individuals get engaged in conflict, as certain ones become kind of locally famous, you know, there's some elephants that the local people just love and they know. Rivaldo is an like, example. Exactly. Yeah. And, and there's yeah. there's several elephants named Ganesh in different parts of the country、yes. who fit that that you know that description. And so we can actually you you know get individualized profiles of elephants and treat them. As citizens, you know they are just non-human citizens of our country. Right. And I think that once you have see them as individuals, we can all, we can also make sure that we look out for their welfare in a way that you know, given how much we've done to the natural environment in India now, how little space they have, I think we have some sort of obligation、right. to to make sure that that at least human caused、uh, suffering is 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 at a minimum. So my question then is on behalf of all young biologists. What would be your advice for a young biologist or conservationist who is entering the field and who's passionate about elephants? What advice do you have for them? So, I think that those of us who really love animals, yeah,、um, and elephants. Well, not all of us. I think some of us seem to have more creative pathways, but a lot of us end up going into biology, ecology, like the traditional、yeah. animal-related sciences. And it just seems like a natural fit because you love animals and you、yeah. want to help them in some way. Yeah. But the truth is that conservation is a super multidisciplinary field. It's and it's it's not just about you know it's not I mean it, animal elephant ecology for instance is important. Elephant physiology is really important. Population ecology these things are you know are key. Like knowing how many elephants is out there is a population ecology problem. But in addition to those core biological problems, there are problems of economics and and political science. How do you make sure that The communities that are living alongside elephants have enough of a voice in in decision making to make sure they aren't adversely affected by elephants, but also aren't in a situation where they can kind of just take too much away from elephants. I mean, coming up with the equitable and just way to find that balance—that's a I think a political science and economics problem. There's a lot of questions about culture and sort of understanding how people relate to elephants,、mm-hmm. psychology. So it's really a multidisciplinary problem and. I think we actually, you know, I think we probably have in many ways an oversupply of biologists in conservation and undersupply of these other things. And so, I guess what I would recommend to a young person is figure out a part of this kind of human elephant coexistence problem that really a- appeals to you. And you know, if it is a pure biological problem, then by all means, get the skills for for population, you know,、yeah. estimation stuff like that. But otherwise, if you happen to be into arts, you're into economics, you're into political science,、mm. use those skills. Tackle an element of the human elephant coexistence problem that's related to that discipline that you love, and just try and solve that problem. Figure out whatever skills you need, whatever discipline you need to help address that problem, and you will be invaluable to us as an elephant conservation community. So this question, the last question, is on behalf of everyone who's listening or、um, watching. What is it that the person who's listening or watching can do for elephants? So, I mentioned earlier that it's been challenging to come up with like an SOP for、yeah. human elephant conflicts because they're so complicated.、Um, a creature compared to tigers. No offense,、mm-hmm. tiger lovers. They're great too.、Um, but in a similar way, it can be complicated to say what exactly a, an individual should do for elephants.、Um, Given that the problems that elephants face are so diverse, but but here are a couple of things. One is kind of if you live in a place that's near elephants,、yeah. so if you're near a corridor or a habitat that's important to them, you know, find local experts. It, people love elephants across this country, and every place where there are elephants, there are people who understand the local issues really well. Where there's WF India office, that's a great place to to start. We have people who just have decades of experience working on this on these issues,、um, and so. Figure out locally, like 
Are there corridors that need help? Maybe you can go and help monitor them, which would be a great mm -hmm. way to start. Um, are there questions about how to remove invasive species? Maybe there's some way you can get involved with community-based efforts on that. Maybe there are areas that we've already identified for protection, but you know the government needs a little bit of a nudge. So like not because they don't care, but just because they have a lot on their plate. And so they need to know that the public cares about this and that they will get more support publicly if they yeah. can provide that extra protection for a corridor or for an you know for a mm -hmm. habitat. Um, if you're in a place where there's conflict, you know, go and talk to the local people and you know just learn about their experience because they understand better than anyone mm. um, what it's like. And you find organizations that are working to help protect elephants and support, support them uh, in whatever way you, you think is appropriate. Obviously, WF India should, should be one of those organizations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nitin. And thank you for listening uh, to Nature Matters, WWF India's podcast for people and the planet. Mm -hmm.